this unprecedented power crisis in Western Europe, in Germany. I'm talking to my friends over there. They're worried that their monthly energy bills for their households will be greater than their monthly mortgage. That's how bad the situation is. And you really look and you say, what happened here? Europe is experiencing firsthand the dangers of relying too heavily from a nation that might not be so friendly to you in the future, and that's Russia. We're not immune to this. Even though we don't get our natural gas from Russia, we do get another fuel that is incredibly important to our U.S. energy system, and that's uranium. Here to talk about this and possible alternatives to Russian uranium is Amir Adnani. He is the CEO of Uranium Energy Corporation, and he is joined by Spencer Abraham. Spencer is a former U.S. Senator from Michigan, and he was the Secretary of Energy under President George W. Bush. He is the Chairman of the Board of Uranium Energy Company. Welcome to this week's edition of Global Macro Update from Malden Economics. Thank you both for joining me. It has been such a year for the energy sector. Prices uh, really on a roller coaster and supply issues. Uh, certainly globally, we're hearing about them every day, what's happening in Europe. But uh, over the summer, the incredibly hot summer that we had here in the U.S., we ran into supply issues, grid issues in states like Texas and California. Now we're hearing about potentially uh, natural gas issues heading into the winter in New England. Uh, what, a, what an interesting time to be in the energy markets. Uh, I'd really like to help everyone understand where we're at in this country and in the West with energy. And maybe we could start out with just a real basic question. Spencer, can you give us an idea of where our energy in the U.S. at least comes from predominantly by a fuel source? In terms of electricity uh, production, uh, the, the major not the majority, but the largest share right now is natural gas. And that's I think around 37 uh, percent, give or take, um, okay. coal and uh, and nuclear are both uh, in at around 20 percent each. So that puts you up to 77 percent from those three sources. Then you have uh, a growing uh, share of the market is uh, is renewable energy. This would be in the categories of solar or wind or geothermal. That's probably about 15 percent or so. And then the the rest is hydropower. So it's, you know, notwithstanding all of the uh, the focus on clean energy or renewable energy, uh, we still are talking about 57% uh, coming from fossil fuels and 20% uh, coming from uh, nuclear energy still today. I think people would be surprised to know that upwards of 20% still comes from coal in this country. Yeah, I mean, it's a declining percentage, but it's still you know, significant, and, and there are a variety of factors there which range from, you know, what are the plants that exist in certain areas? And in many cases, they're, they're coal-fired power plants, um, and they, they're not easy or cheap to replace, so, you know, that's, that's you know, there's a lag there, and, and the price of coal has been reasonable, so, you know, in situations where cost is a factor, it, it uh, still, you know, makes coal a, a uh, you know, a choice, uh, but it is a declining percentage. I mean, there was a time when coal was uh, nearly 50% of America's uh, electricity generation source, and we have abundant supplies. Uh, now those will probably be exported to other countries to use. So is there a shortage of what you would call baseload energy sources in this country today? Um, we, kind of where we need to be. Well, certainly we have the potential to have, you know, to meet the demand of, uh, you know, the, the base load. But I think we have a growing sort of policy preference for alternatives. And as we know, when you're dealing with intermittent sources of, of, of electricity, such as wind or solar, where you have situations that, that don't make it possible for them to operate, uh, then you need to understand the need for the base sources to still be available. And uh, that's one of the, I think, especially attractive elements about, you know, nuclear energy, which obviously uh, Amir and I are uh, deeply involved in, because uh, with nuclear power, um, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about a clean energy source that provides almost 67 percent 
of the clean energy, the non-fossil or emitting energy in the U.S. today still, uh, but not one that's uh, dependent on uh, uh, climate situations, wind and, and whether or not the sun's out uh, to function. And I think that's a pretty uh, uh, interesting thing that are, 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 I think a lot of uh, folks who cover the energy world or who talk about it and debate it don't seem to, to grasp until we have, you know, a blackout or we have, you know, uh, this, this location that, sh you know, reshuffles the sort of uh, uh, understanding of things. And yet, Spencer, in, in Europe and Japan, certainly, there's been a move away from nuclear. And I think that uh, uh, up until very recently, now they're starting to reconsider that, it sounds like. But why do you think there was this move away from nuclear in Europe, which you know, I always associate as, as a fairly green-oriented area of the world, um, and yet moving away from it. Was this simply an issue of the age of their reactors, lack of investment? No, I think it was, it was politics. I mean, and I think that notwithstanding the fact that nuclear power is the, the principal source of clean electricity production, uh, there had, there, there's been, a, of course, for, for decades, an anti-nuclear movement uh, that's gained traction in a lot of those countries. Not in France, where it's the dominant source of electricity, but in places like Germany, who made the decision to slowly but surely get rid of their entire nuclear fleet. Fortunately, I think, they've come to the, their senses. It took, it took you know, uh, the Russians uh, and, and Putin's decision to cut back on their supplying of natural gas to make it happen. But suddenly, the even the German uh, uh, political leaders recognized that if they close all of their nuclear plants, uh, they're even more at the mercy of uh, imports. Uh, Japan's a different story. That was, I think, uh, every the, 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 the slowdown in the use of nuclear there was directly related to the Fukushima disaster, and uh, now that's coming back as well, because there's a realization that you can have nuclear power safely delivered, uh, and Japan is moving to open up more and more uh, nuclear capabilities. Amir, anything to add on, on that front? Probably also adding that this concept of offshoring, you could argue in Western Europe, also found its way into energy uh, policy in the sense that energy was also, uh, in a way, offshore, not literally, but in a way, handed over to Russia. I mean, one of the biggest reasons why we have this unprecedented power crisis in Western Europe, in Germany, uh, you look at what's going on with pricing. I'm talking to my friends over there, they're worried that their uh, energy, monthly energy bills for their households will be greater come uh, winter than their monthly mortgage. Uh, that's how bad the situation is. And you really look and you say, what happened here? And Western Europe became completely of the view that they're just, uh, they're just outsourcing their energy to, uh, to Russia and that Russia will, will provide everything from nuclear reactors, nuclear fuel, uh, and of course, uh, oil and gas. Just to add, I mean, the other, uh, to build on what, what, what Amir was saying is the, the frustrating thing it is as an observer, to me at least, the frustrating thing is, uh, you know, that you have people in some of these countries who have now seen, uh, by, by dismantling their nuclear capabilities, they've now been forced to burn more coal. Right. And given that the bottom line is supposed to be reducing CO2 emissions, uh, they've, they've essentially done they put themselves in a situation where on the one hand, they're very dependent on uh, a very undependable source of energy, natural gas. And on the other hand, they're now burning coal instead of running nuclear plants, which means that their objective of reducing uh, emissions is harder to reach. Uh, I just never understand this. And I find it frustrating because uh, it just doesn't seem to me, it doesn't matter where CO2 is being emitted. I mean, if you're, if you're burning, you're burning coal in China instead of in Europe, but you're burning the same amount. There's there's no gain, and and that's where I find some of those policies to be uh, contradictory. Agreed, and I I want to get into policy with you because it seems like that is the hardest thing to get right 
especially in the, the, the political climate that we have in the country now, where we've got, got the parties at such extremes. Um, it, it seems to me energy policy in the U.S. at least should be built around making sure that there's a, a reliable, consistent, steady supply of as much energy as we can use um, and delivered in as cost efficient and environmentally responsible a way possible. That, that doesn't seem like a um, uh, controversial statement, right? But once you get past that is where things seem to break down. So can, can you give me an idea of what your assessment, Spencer, is of energy policy in the U.S. today and maybe where it needs to go? Well, you know, we've kind of seen a, a, a transition since I served as energy secretary. Back when I was there, uh, the the lines were not very clearly drawn by party as much as they were by region. And there were regions where Republicans and Democrats alike were, you know, uh, strong supporters, uh, robust supporters of producing energy because that was a major I mean, you know, the Sun Belt area, Texas, and so on. They were, these were, uh, you know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you wanted to see a strong oil and gas industry. Uh, whereas if you were in the Northeast, uh, you were more inclined to want to minimize environmental, uh, negative environmental consequences. And it, and it sort of was more regional than it was partisan. Today, that's less the case. Uh, and so you do have, you know, a growing, as you indicated, partisan divide between folks who, on the one hand, uh, you know, one side or uh, understand the need to have reliable and affordable energy available, not only to, you know, make sure that that residential customers and, and citizens are safe and warm and 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 financially solid but also to make sure that our industries and manufacturing and so on can operate at a, at a profit. And on the other hand, you have folks who are, you know, putting, who, who have latched into, locked into and latched onto uh, the issues that relate to climate uh, to the exclusion of sort of what I would call a, a fair balance between the two that you, you talked about. Uh, as I got sort of two sides here, I, I do think that the, the American people are, in my experience, watching the political games that are played. The, they're, they're, they want, you know, what you said uh, earlier, they want clean, affordable energy. But when the price gets too high or the availability diminishes, uh, then they then they move the other way and they say, we don't care anymore. We're not going to we're not <laughs> we still care about the environment, but not enough to you know have our families freeze in the winter or boil in the summer or have to give up uh, other important things in our lives to be able to pay for it. So you said coal is a declining energy source for the electrical grid. Right. Um, is nuclear an increasing source? It's It's been pretty stable in this 20% range uh, because really we haven't added to the nuclear uh, uh, fleet. We, we've had the same number of reactors, give or take a few, uh, for decades. Uh, I personally would like to see the role of nuclear grow because it allows us to have uh, uh, a source of energy that's, you know, baseload power right. and not dependent, you know, on, uh, you know, other countries and other factors, assuming that, that we put an, an effort into growing our own uh, sources of nuclear fuel and, and, and the feedstock for it. Uh, and it's not emitting. So it seems to me it's a win-win. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, for so many years, we heard how bad nuclear was from people who thought that was the greatest environmental threat we had. Now they've come to realize, I think, that uh, other issues uh, are, are have supplanted it, and they're slowly warming up to to, to be nuclear, at least, if not supporters, at least uh, tolerate a role for nuclear. But I think a 30% share would even be better than 20. So if you're a capital allocator or an investor, uh, you need to have some clarity when it comes to policy, right? Especially in the energy sector, because it's so capital intensive. You've got a long lead time for, for permitting. I mean, you, if you go to permit any, what, nuclear or other, any type of, of production facility, 
uh, you could run into a situation where you start with, with one party in office and, and end with another. So there's a lot of risk there um, between, between permitting and construction and bringing something online at scale and the capital that you put at risk. Is the, is the policy structure in this country in place to allow for new nuclear development? Well, it's been challenging. You know, and challenging because of the exact things you've said, the not in my backyard syndrome, which has made many communities, uh, after initially approving uh, or, or, or supporting nuclear, a new nuclear facility, change their minds or, or have at a higher political level have it rejected. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been a major factor in, in terms of why we haven't seen new builds. Uh, but I think that, that the movement towards small modular reactors that we're now seeing emerge uh, could change that discussion. I think there's going to be a, a greater acceptance of these smaller reactors. I think there's going to be the ability to place them in locations that are less uh, uh, object objecting to them, uh, greater receptivity to them. Uh, so I see there being, that's, I think, how we, we grow the sector. I don't think we're going to see, you know, too many or many at all large, you know, uh, traditional sized nuclear facilities built. But I think the smaller reactors have a great chance to emerge in the next uh, decade or two as a major new component in the uh, global or U.S. energy mix. Amir, you touched on this a little bit earlier, and I want to get into it deeper with you. The, the pandemic exposed all kinds of supply chain issues, all kinds of reliances that our manufacturers have on other countries, some of whom we maybe don't want to trade with so much anymore. What does the supply of uranium look like? Does the U.S. have, if not a domestic, at least a, a friendly source that can be grown for uranium to support any growth in that sector? Yeah, so the bad news is that there's no uranium mining in the United States today, which means we're 100% dependent on foreign imports. And the further bad news is that Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, those two former Soviet Union countries, make up more than half of the uranium supplies coming into the U.S. And Russia has been a major supplier of nuclear fuel conversion enrichment to the U.S. market. Uh, this is the bad news. The good news is that the U.S. Uh, does have, according to U.S. Geological Survey, some of the largest uh, uranium resources or deposits uh, and potential for new uranium discovery. And in the past, the 70s and the 80s, the U.S. used to lead the world when it came to uranium mining and uranium production. So the good news is that there's tremendous geologic potential uh, and it's very much, uh, very analogous, and, and Spence can speak to this as well, to what happened in oil, where there was incredible dependency on imports of oil. And turning that around not only enhanced national security and energy security in the U.S., but it became uh, an economic engine. It, it meant that Tens and thousands of tens, tens of thousands of jobs were created, and and billions of dollars were invested in uh, developing what became the oil patch in, in this much enlarged way, and the, and the same potential is certainly there with uranium, and and I think this is the issue that we've been addressing very much head on with Uranium Energy Corp, our company, where just in the last year we've made. Uh, almost half a billion dollars in acquisitions, acquiring physical uranium, acquiring companies, uh, and including a very famous company, Uranium One, which uh, uh, you know your your audience might be familiar with, that was previously owned by the Russian government. So we're really of the view that there is while, while the current situation is one of uh, a major national security risk, that there's this. Uh, incredible dependence on Russia to power one in every five home in America, which is the 20% of electricity that's coming from nuclear energy. There is a solution here in the U.S. as well. Uh, and that's, that solution is the potential and the promise of what could become a very vibrant and, and very dynamic domestic uranium mining industry. 
So fracking had a huge impact on energy costs globally and, and certainly in the U.S. Is there, is there a comparable for, for uranium, for extracting uranium in a way that is maybe less expensive and makes it so that Russian uranium isn't quite as attractive? Maybe it's, maybe it's what Spencer referenced earlier with a smaller uh, application of, of a plant? There is, in fact, uh, uh, there is a method of mining uranium called in-situ recovery, uh, which was uh, originally invented in Texas and Wyoming and was then taken to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and the same method was developed there to mine uranium in uh, the lowest cost way and also in the, more, in the most environmentally friendly way because in-situ recovery is an alternative to conventional strip mining, underground open pit mining, which could be very expensive and it could have a, it would require a lot of uh, surface and it, it, it leaves you with waste rock and tailings pond and all those, all those issues are not there when you utilize the in-situ recovery technology and the deposits in the US, in Texas, in Wyoming are amenable to this very low cost in-situ recovery method. And in fact, that's the technology that our company is prioritizing for uh, building new production centers in the U.S. So you both obviously being on the board of Uranium Energy Corporation, you, you are bullish on this sector. What do you feel like the demand curve looks like for, for uranium? When does that 20% of overall energy consumption or, or, or production in the U.S., when does that start to ramp up? Yeah, so two, two points on that, right? The, that demand uh, in the U.S. is going looks like anything that you've never seen before. What do I mean by that is despite the fact that there, are, there aren't many large new reactors being built in the U.S., there's 94 reactors already operating. That makes the U.S. the largest market in the world for uranium demand today. So that puts uranium demand in the US alone at 50 million pounds of uranium annually and domestic production at zero. Ed, what is another industry you can think of where the US consumes 50 million pounds per year of an energy commodity powering 20% of the nation yet doesn't produce any, any of it domestically? I just It just blows my mind every time I think about that. But globally, there's 200 million pounds of annual demand. So that 50 million of U.S. demand is part of 200 million pounds of annual demand globally. And global supply from mining is only 130 million pounds per year. So globally, there's a supply deficit when we think about 200 million pounds of demand versus 130 million pounds of production. And globally, there's enormous growth in building new large-scale reactors. China alone wants to build 150 new reactors, large ones, one gigawatt reactors, over the next 15 years. South Korea, uh, even in, in Europe and, and, and other countries that are all facing the same issue. And Japan, which was the country that had uh, the most uh, difficult uh, issue to deal with nuclear with the Fukushima incident in 2011 has recently announced that it will be pivoting its energy policy back towards restarting nuclear reactors and building new ones. And of course, in Europe, the European taxonomy was voted by member states in the Euro uh, European Union to include nuclear power along with natural gas for the first time. To Spence's point, in the United States, the growth is going to come from small modular reactors. But throughout the world, we are actually seeing unprecedented growth taking place in building and planning of large-scale reactors from China and India all the way through to uh, other parts of Europe and, of course, back in Japan, where the nuclear winter that we experienced from 2011 onwards was because of what happened there. And if Japan is shifting back towards nuclear energy, that's a very telling and compelling sign of these very important characteristics nuclear energy does possess, which in today's world, where we're trying to uh, pursue electrification at the same time as decarbonization, these two mega trends require a greater role to be played by nuclear energy if we're going to have any chance at reducing global temperatures while putting more electric vehicles on, on the road.
Spencer, it seems like there should be some policy that would encourage domestic production of uranium. I mean, this is a, clearly a national security issue. Are you aware of any such policies under consideration? Well, you know, at the um, near the end of the Trump administration, uh, the idea emerged of developing a uh, domestic uh, uranium um, reserve, which would sort of be similar to what we have in the uh, oil uh, arena, where we have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And that is slowly but surely, you know, getting off the ground. Uh, it didn't uh, move as fast as we would have liked to see it move. Uh, but the idea was to, you know, begin to storehouse uh, uranium uh, in case, you know, there was, uh, you know, a, a problem with uh, imports on the one hand, and on the other hand, to try to give these domestic, domestic <laughs> companies like UEC uh, the opportunity to fill that reserve and to give them, you know, a reason to then begin production again. Um, but that's so far, I think, the, the principal policy. There, there are others floating around right now, and the Department of Energy has expressed a desire to, to have a very, very robust program for the combined uh, areas of fuel uh, uh, enrichment of conversion and of uranium development. I'm not sure that uh, their primary focus is going to be on, on the domestic uh, production of uranium or mining, but I think it will be included because at the end of the day, uh, if your concerns are about being dependent on imports, uh, you've got to make sure that all parts of the fuel cycle are ones that we can take care of domestically. And certainly we have the capacity, uh, whether it's uh, in terms of existing mining or new mining opportunities, uh, we certainly have enough, uh, enough reserves. We just have to make it possible for American companies to successfully compete. That's been hard, uh, both for some of the reasons previously discussed and because uh, as, as Amir alluded to earlier, these two you know, large uh, producers, the Russians and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Kazakhs and so on, are, uh, they're, 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 their operations are state subsidized. And so they're, they've been able to produce uranium at, an, at, a, at a lower price than a, a, a free market company like ours can, can, can achieve. And so uh, we need to get past that. And the way to get past it, I think, is first, global demand growth that Amir alluded to. Second, I think a growing awareness by importers that they may not want to be exclusively dependent on, com on countries uh, who are showing uh, a willingness to use uh, energy exports as a political uh, weapon. Uh, and third, uh, the fact that, uh, that, that you know, we will have the sort of demand uh, change that, that we anticipate. So I think there's a lot of a lot of uh, promising uh, opportunities in the area, and that's why we're so bullish, as you said, about uh, this uh, sector going forward. So, last question for you both, as I know we're, we're running out of time, but there are I know there's been a significant amount of government funding, U.S. government funding, going into the development of these smaller re nuclear reactors that you've both mentioned, and there's also people like. Warren Buffett and, and Bill Gates, you know, the, the, the most uh, active billionaire investors of our age, uh, focused on this sector as well. It seems inevitable. It seems like everyone wants this to happen. Any idea as to how close we are to commercialization of this type of technology? Amir, I'll, I'll throw that to you. Well, first of all, this type of technology is uh, it has a longstanding uh, track record. The, uh, over a hundred uh, of these uh, small reactors or micro reactors are uh, powering the nuclear navy. Aircraft carriers and submarines uh, have for decades been operating on micro reactors. Uh, uh, sp space exploration by NASA and Elon Musk's plans to get to Mars are all powered by micro reactors. And so SMRs, in fact, you have a track record that, that, that successfully has demonstrated uh, powering uh, uh, both uh, it, it areas that, that, that you would figure would, would have to go through a great deal of scrutiny and, and testing to be viable. Um, 
Finally, I think we've seen breakthrough with Bill Gates' Terra Power uh, signing and, and looking to build the first uh, uh, SMR on U.S. soil in Wyoming. Uh, and uh, we've seen similar announcements uh, with New Scale signing a deal in Romania, looking to build uh, an SMR there. Uh, and, and ultimately, I think this is an area that is absolutely real. Uh, it's very promising. And we're going to see really significant growth uh, with the development of new SMRs uh, moving forward. Amir Adnani, Spencer Abraham, both from Uranium Energy Corporation, I really appreciate your time. This was a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this interview informative. If you would like to get a transcript of this and all of our interviews emailed to you each week, there is a link in the YouTube description below. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel. My name is Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics. Thanks for watching.